As someone fascinated by engineering, I still remember the day I saw the Airbus A380, the biggest passenger jet in the world, take off on one of its first flights. Seeing the giant double-deck four-engine jet airliner fly close by was one of those cool moments where a technology surpassed all of my expectations of what's possible. And so early this year, I was shocked to hear that Airbus will completely end production on the A380 by 2021. Despite the ever-increasing air travel, it seems like the A380 is not the right solution for this time. And to understand why, we need to look back at some of the history of aviation. In the late 1950s, the first jet airliners revolutionized civil aviation. Before, in order to travel long distances with the propeller planes of the time, many stops along the way were required, and connecting destinations between Europe and the United States was a challenge. New jet airliners such as the Douglas DC-8 and the Boeing 707 were able to reach much higher altitudes and therefore operated much more efficiently. In 1958, the Boeing 707, the company's first jet airliner, began its regular service by connecting New York City and London. It changed traveling completely. The transatlantic route between Europe and America already had a large and steadily growing demand. And with the help of more efficient aircraft, aviation gradually displaced the large ocean liners of the time. While one industry was booming, another one was in a decline. And by the mid-1970s, only the Queen Elizabeth II remained, which operated as a transatlantic liner only for certain months of the year. Airlines and manufacturers were looking for solutions to handle the enormous demand, which caused congestion at airports not able to grow in size quick enough. A large aircraft could carry passengers even more effectively between high-demand routes and would also reduce capacity problems caused by many small airplanes at airports. Boeing developed the 747, dubbed the Jumbo Jet, which became the world's largest passenger jet at the time. In a way, it brought aviation to a whole new era and set modern standard for the size of new airports. It also allowed carriers to offer longer trips. Interestingly, during the development, Boeing was actually very uncertain about the long-term prospects of the 747. At that time, there was a big belief that sooner or later supersonic aircraft would dominate the passenger market. So in order to make sure that the costly development would be worth it, the plane was from the start designed to function as a cargo plane. While in the passenger version the upper deck is used for the first class lounge, the cargo version has the ability to lift the front cockpit, therefore making it a wide door for cargo. But the passenger version was a success, as the 747 became the queen of the skies for more than three decades. And its success is also based on the implementation of a transportation concept used by airlines. In order to offer cheap flights, airlines try to keep their planes as booked out as possible. However, there are many routes between which there just isn't enough demand to justify a regular, direct flight. This is called a point-to-point -point system. The problem with this is that all of these flights would not be very busy, and it takes a huge number of small aircraft which will take up costly landing slots at airports. With this system, expanding the airline's network is a slow and cumbersome process. Therefore, airlines tend to use certain bigger airports as hubs where passengers transfer to connecting flights. This allows airlines to better plan passenger flows and also to increase their network quickly. If, for example, another destination is added to this network, suddenly a multitude of new routes becomes possible. Even flights to smaller locations will carry many passengers, as the demand has been gathered at the hub location. And the flights between the different hubs have a very high volume anyway. So large planes, such as the Boeing 747, can be filled and therefore are particularly economical. For that reason, in the 1990s, Airbus wanted to stop Boeing's superiority in the field of wide-body aircrafts with a competing product. In the year 2000, after extensive market research, they decided to build the A380, the world's first full double-deck jet airliner.
In addition to the economic consideration to weaken Boeing, the project also found much political support, as the A380 symbolized the European idea with parts that are produced throughout Europe, such as the engines in Great Britain, the rear fuselage and tail fin in Germany, and the horizontal tail plane in Spain, all to be assembled in Toulouse, France. Airbus received billions in loans from the governments of Germany, France and the United Kingdom. And in 2018, those subsidies have been ruled improper by the World Trading Organization. But even at market entry, the timing was not ideal for Airbus. While the initial entry into the flight operations was scheduled for 2005, several production difficulties caused delays until the end of 2007. Once the production at Airbus moved out, the 2008 global economic crisis shook the aviation market. Airlines made billions in losses and the crisis dampened orders for new aircrafts of all sort. And unlike Boeing with the 747, Airbus did not end up making a cargo version of the A380. Another problem is that the A380 is only ideal for a very specific situation, which in turn makes Airbus dependent on a few customers that follow the same philosophy Airbus went for. Just how specific this is can be seen with the New York-London connection. The route connecting both hubs earns British Airways more than $1 billion in revenue each year, making it the most profitable route in the world. And even though British Airways owns 12 A380s, they don't operate them on this route. Instead, they operate a mix of 747s, 777s and business class only A318s. One of the reasons is that there is a very high competition on a route like this, connecting two hub airports. While British Airways offers the most with six round trips a day, there are also Virgin Atlantic, American Airlines and Delta flights on this route. Since there are so many different flights between which passengers can choose, the load per flight is not that high. The A380 is well suited for connections where there is a high passenger density, but a small number of flights. Between two hubs such as New York and London, however, there are many customers who also need flexibility, and British Airways would be less competitive if they reduced the current six slots to just four daily flights on the A380. But there are also airlines with a philosophy that matches the A380. With 109 aircrafts, Emirates is by far the largest customer of the A380, followed by Singapore Airlines with 24 aircraft. Both are state-owned airlines, and as flag carriers of very small nations, they pursue the same business model. Emirates' entire fleet consists of wide-body aircraft shuttling back and forth between its Dubai hub and destinations worldwide. Dubai's position is strategically valuable for connecting North America and Europe with Asia and Australia, functioning as a springboard between international destinations. However, the aviation world is changing and trending towards more direct connections, even on long-haul routes, replacing the hub-and-spoke system with point-to-point -point travel. One reason for this is Boeing's 787 Dreamliner. Boeing developed the aircraft about the same time as Airbus worked on the A380, but with a completely different strategy. The market advantage of the 787 is not its capacity, but its reduced operating cost. The fuselage is mainly made of carbon fiber reinforced plastic, which saves weight. And for the first time, instead of using the engines to provide cabin pressure, they use a bleedless system in which the engine start, cabin pressurization, de-icing and other functions are achieved through electronic systems. This massively increases the engine's fuel efficiency. And with all of those fuel savings, the 787 allows longer direct flights, reducing the need for big planes like the A380 to bring people to hub airports. All these reasons led to low demand for the A380, and Airbus tried to find new customers worldwide to keep hope up. But since the A380's success was dependent on some few big customers, once Emirates cancelled their order for 39 more A380s, Airbus had to pull the plug on the project. The question that remains is whether we should therefore think of the A380 as a failure. Because even though it simply isn't lucrative enough for business considerations, this does not change the engineering achievement of constructing a plane of this size. And there have been no incidents leading to fatalities, more serious injuries or crashes with the A380. After all, 
a number of record-breaking inventions go down this path. The Concorde, the first passenger aircraft with supersonic speed, failed less because of technology than because of an inefficient business model. And a maglev that promised to revolutionize train travel is struggling with a similar problem. Therefore, when looking at new technologies being developed, we should remember to also find business models that support engineering achievements.